Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Que tu gets the rewa. Anumazu, Fasalama, Chimarar, Chimaruf, Mazu is up to Diavi. Our first field season in two thousand and one was by far the most difficult. The first month here was literally spent just walking through the forest all day looking for this single group of silkies and never seeing them. And I think it may have only been until the fourth or the fifth week where we actually saw them and they flew by us like ghosts. And that was it. Until now, the silky safanka lemur, one of the world's most endangered primates, has never been caught on tape. Like almost all of Madagascar's land animals, lemurs are an endemic species, which means that they live nowhere else on Earth. An astonishing 98% of Madagascar's land mammals, 92% of its reptiles, 68% of its plants, and 41% of its bird species are found only in Madagascar. Because of its white fur and its amazing ability to fly through the forest, the silky safanka lemurs are often called the angels of the forest. But these gorgeous animals are one of the world's top 25 most endangered primates. If the silky safanka were to disappear from Madagascar, then the silky safanka would disappear from our world. But there are other types of angels in Madagascar's forests. International scientists and local Malagasy conservationists are fighting for the survival of this rare primate species and its irreplaceable habitat. It's 5.30, just after dawn. Uh, we're a little bit late, but we're off to see the silkies. At the forefront of this research is Eric Patel. He's a PhD candidate from Cornell University in biological psychology. He first came to Madagascar in 2001 to study how silky safaka lemurs communicate using sounds and scent markings. Silky safakas are, are among the world's rarest primates and among the four rarest lemurs in Madagascar. These animals are long-lived, highly social, just like us. We have no idea if silkies will be here in 50 years. We can make a more informed judgment as to their likelihood of extinction if we know how many are remaining and where they are found. Because of the remote and inaccessible nature of silky safanka terrain, very little was known about this species before Eric's work. Alfred Grandidier has been given credit as the first Westerner to discover and publish a description of the silky safaka in 1871. He was extremely curious as to why the silky safakas had white fur and decided that the silky safakas must be an albino version of a different type of lemur. However, it wasn't until over 100 years later, following extensive genetic testing and skeletal examination, we now know that silky safakas are not albinos, but are in fact their own species. Of lemur. In the year 2000, the silkies were studied more closely by Dr. Patricia Wright. I went to the top of that beautiful sacred mountain, Marajeji, 
and captured the first group of silky shavakas to ever be captured and followed him from dawn to dusk. It was like being transported to a different world. At the top of the sacred mountain, these incredibly white flying angels in the forest, it was just, it was, it was really a spiritual experience. <laughs> Covering more than 226,000 square miles, Madagascar is the world's fourth largest island and is approximately the size of Texas. In the past, much of Madagascar was covered by untouched forest. Humans did not arrive on the island until 1,500 years ago. But in the relatively short time span of those 1,500 years, the majority of that forest, up to 80%, has been destroyed, largely by economic activities such as logging and crop cultivation. With the human population topping 18 million and growing, the island's natural ecosystems are strained. Uh, over the course of the past few centuries, the population of Madagascar has doubled, quadrupled, many, many times over. And it's abundantly clear that the, the biological crisis of Madagascar is rooted in socioeconomic problems. As population expands and there are more and more pressures on the natural ecosystems of the island, the need to implement and advance and properly organized conservation programs becomes uh, much more uh, pressing. You can't work in Madagascar and not get caught up with conservation. A lot of forest is disappearing every single day, and it is shocking to think how little rainforest may be left in a very short amount of time. While some lemurs can live alongside humans and even survive in zoos, silky safaka lemurs are more sensitive and only live in forests that has not been altered by human intrusion or development. Because of Eric Patel's research on the silky safakas found in Marojeji National Park, the Malagasy government has made conservation of Eric's research zone a priority. Marojeji National Park comprises almost 150,000 acres and rises to almost 7,000 feet at its summit. Because silkies are high-altitude rainforest lemurs and are only found above 2,300 feet of elevation, the park is critical habitat for their conservation. The foreign researcher is very important for us because the help us to discover a new uh, species. They help us to know more about this nature, to help us as well uh, to manage this park. Although Eric came to Madagascar first and foremost as a scientist in pursuit of knowledge about the silky safaka lemurs, his work soon enveloped him into a world of conservation and education, forever linking him to a variety of individuals from all walks of life, all struggling for the same cause saving the silky safaka lemur. The science and conservation work conducted in Marojeji National Park has become even more critical than ever because the park has been nominated to be a World Heritage Site. But securing this type of protected future for the silky safakas takes a lot of work. So for the sixth year in a row, Eric journeys into Madagascar to check on the status of his lemurs. His journey begins in Madagascar's busy capital of Antananari. Although the city is filled with over two million residents, few of them have heard of their country's silky safaka lemur. While Eric is in the capital, he stops in to see Benjamin Andrea Mihaja at Miset, the Madagascar Institute for Tropical Environments. The main goal is to make research comfortable when they arrived here, and uh, we will prepare their permits 
and uh, facilitate their contact with the local uh, people here in Madagascar. With the reassurance from Miset that all of his permits are in order, Eric leaves to meet up with his local contacts. You can get all the funding in the world and you can have the best ideas in the world, but if you can't find a way to work locally, you'll never be successful. It's, it's impossible to protect the animal you're studying in a country like this without having long-term ties to the local population, without making some serious effort to understand their own plight. Before heading out for a multi-day trip to his site in Marojeji National Park, Eric meets up with Rabari Desiree, one of his Malagasy collaborators, to shop for supplies. Rabari Desiree, he stands out among guides as a, as a very self-educated local man. It's, it's seldom that you find someone who is so self-taught so extensively, who's fluent in both English, French, and Malagasy, but also reads a lot of the biological literature, who can walk through the forest and, and point out a lot of species names, not just lemurs, but also plants, insects, you name it. He, he has something to say about it. I'll be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Thank you. I think that uh, today you are very happy to see Eric Patel from USA. When we do school presentations, Desiree captivates those kids and he pushes them to really think about conservation, to really think about their consequences on the environment, and to think about how lucky they are to have animals this precious near where they live. He's really a spokesperson among spokespersons. At this school in the village at the base of Marojeji National Park, Eric and Desiree are joined by Nestor, another Malagasy collaborator. Nestor will be the third member of the research team on their trip into Marojeji. Nestor in particular, who is incredible at tracking these animals. I mean, he shows us something every single day about how to find these animals. Um, it's not easy. And how to move in the forest quickly and quietly. Um, he's about three times as, as fast and as quiet as the rest of us. Nestor and Desiree are Eric's main Malagasy collaborators. However, Eric's research provides other jobs for local villagers around Marojeji, like setting up camp. Three campsites have been created by the Park Service for tourists and researchers to enjoy on one of Marojeji's mountainsides. Eric bases his research out of Camp 2. Welcome to Camp 2. Marojeji National Park is one of the most mountainous national parks in Madagascar. Where we are at Camp 2 is about 775 meters of elevation. It's pretty steep. People have described the trail that leads to the Silkies home range from here as something like a Stairmaster. Time to go see the Silkies, time for some coffee, time for some breakfast, most importantly, time for some coffee. Usually I wake up at 5, breakfast at 5.30, out of camp by 6, and depends where the animals are, but uh, it can take from 25 to 45 minutes uh, walking uphill to get to the Silkies.
We usually work in a group of three or four people looking for this group at Camp 2. We hoot like owls to find each other. So if we're looking for another team member, we'll kind of give out one hoot, and the other team member will hoot back if they can hear us. If one of us has this group of silky sifakas in view, if we can see them from where we're standing, then we, make, we give out two hoots, a double hoot. That sounds like them. Yeah, they found him. Pink face. Basically, it's just our first day with, with this group, and it's been maybe six months since I've been back. So what I want to do is just um, identify the individuals again, look for any other individually distinctive markers that may have appeared since I was back last, like any new cuts or slashes or broken fingers, um, and try and distinguish the young animals. The young animals are often much more difficult to distinguish. Genitalia is not always apparent until they're older. So we're just trying to figure out who's who in the group and see what's changed. Any new members, any individuals have left, um, stuff like that. After his basic survey of the group at Camp 2, Eric can begin collecting sound recordings of the Silky Safaka's calls. At this stage, um, I'm really only looking for high quality recordings from a couple of the new individuals in the group. So for most of the adults in this group, I've got them pretty well covered. But some of these youngsters, like the, the three-year-old and the two one-year-olds, I'm really interested in getting more sounds from them. We know very little about the sounds that infant lemurs make. A lot more is known about infant monkeys and apes. Eric will add the data that he has collected during his trip to his growing database of lemur calls. With this database, Eric will continue to study silky safaka behavior even when he is not in the field. We have a lot of ideas about what the animals do and why they do them, but what we say and what we write needs to be based on long-term detailed data. And we have to be careful not to look too deeply into our data to pull out what we want to see or what we want to prove. We kind of have to let the animals tell you their story. Silky Safaka day begins around 5.30 in the morning when they awake, high up in their sleeping trees. They start their day with a morning snack. Silky Safakas are folivores, which means they mainly eat leaves, flowers, and other leafy materials. Silkies are also seed predators, who prefer to eat the hard inner seed instead of the outside flesh of a fruit. They travel almost continuously throughout the day, looking for other trees to feed on. Silkies have hind limbs that are 35% longer than their forelimbs. These very long legs help them spring from tree to tree. At each of their stops, they play and groom. Sometimes grooming can get a little out of hand. By midday, they take a nap and by nightfall, they are once again snuggled into high sleeping trees for the night. Before our field study in 2001, it was really very, very difficult for any tourists to see silky safakas 
as a result of this work, these research groups have now become the tourist groups. And that's a real benefit of research to conservation and to ecotourism in Madagascar. For a tourist to come up here and see this charismatic, beautiful, white, fluffy, gorgeous creature and know that they're among the world's top 25 rarest primates in the world, that's a, that's a very special opportunity. I think it's, it's a way for the average person to be kind of moved by conservation, to kind of feel what it's like to be that rare. However, tourists do not have to be from overseas. In the past, local Malagasy children have rarely had the opportunity to explore the natural parks in their own backyard. Eric Desiree and Nestor's educational work with the local children inspired local restaurant owner Bruno Lee to also get involved with the park. Si ni protection ni ni environnement, te inza ni te tapanai we, ilai na misi we, zere u le generation of vouza ne, ila malala zapto zere tare tum kasiyan. Ar <laughs> de la sa manek zaya ma 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 pa diskul ande am parka ya ni yem nah malo ha am ni fitunga vunga to malo tenga mafnar ari am ni zafta misangat atom ni marujeji tsfa utanya ni antananga andapa Ici, Yerubans <laughs> We need the Malagasy people living around the Marzid uh, work with us about protecting this area because without them it is impossible uh, to conserve the nature of earth. They are the source, the main source of the destruction of the forest is the village people. I tell them, ah, let us protect the forest and uh, visitors will come and money will come also. Ah, it's like this and they follow. Desiree's experiences working with Eric Patel have made him an avid conservationist. And although his salary is meager by American standards, Desiree still finds money to put aside to purchase land. He is slowly creating his own nature reserve, which he has named Antana Tiambo, which means high mountain. It is not a large reserve, but it's sufficient to protect some group of bamboo lemur, microsebis, uh, reptile and amphibians, and uh, some birds also. A trip out to Desiree's nature reserve with Eric has his guest bring out the whole village. By attracting foreign scientists, Desiree sparks local interest in conservation and demonstrates the economic potential of ecotourism.
Now, in Madagascar, people are more and more uh, becoming conservationist. People in this region are very happy with the work, the good work of Eric Patel. The local people are very happy to collaborate with him in the protection of the biodiversity in general, but mainly to protect the silky sea. I don't think it's too late for conservation, but we've got to use every second that we can to preserve these areas for the future. I really feel that everybody that does science should be thinking on the conservation angles because they need the data from the science to actually manage these very endangered and getting more endangered habitats. When people are thinking about Madagascar, right now what happens is they are always thinking about poverty, one of the poorest countries in the world. We have to change that face. The big challenge is, and our hope is people when they think about Madagascar, they will see that Madagascar is a little paradise where the biodiversity and the local population living there are nice, are good, and living together in harmony. Well, the, the critical issue is, you know, we as foreign researchers are visitors in Madagascar. And the, uh, the future of the country rests in the hands of Malagasy. It has to be that way. That's the only logical combination. Being an island in Madagascar, mainly in this region, Antapa Basin, the isolation is very heavy. So it's a way, a, a way to break the isolation in this region, uh, being included in any activity about ecotourism and conservation. The only thing I know for sure is that I like working here, that I'm really concerned about the silkies, and that I, I like doing research. I think silkies are the most beautiful lemurs. That's completely biased and um, selfish, but um, so be it. Foreign researchers and local Malagasy collaborators are fighting together for the silky survival. Like the Malagasy saying, si belambanina ni ambalanitra. All who live under the sky are woven together like one big mat. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.